Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar on composite steel design of bridges to Eurocodes. In this third set of uh, Eurocode series of webinars, we will be looking into important aspects of composite uh, steel bridge design, how to optimize the composite design as by using uh, Midas uh, Civil software, uh, using finite element uh, modeling, and uh, how we can save time um, by doing the automated design checks. Okay, so we'll be covering in the next 45 minutes uh, uh, the following topics uh, starting with uh, how to set up the model for composite steel design, basis of design, um, material properties, classification of sections, ULS checks and serviceability checks. So pretty much most of the topics are uh, very similar to uh, what we covered in the last webinar on steel bridge design. Um, with a few additions on composite uh, uh, steel bridge uh, point of view. Okay, the first thing is very important as to how we set up the model uh, for a composite uh, bridge design. Now, since it's a composite uh, structure, so uh, different parts of the uh, bridge have been constructed at different intervals. So we need to simulate the correct construction methodology of the bridge. Uh, for example, how the steel girders were propped during construction and then uh, concrete was poured on them, how the concrete was poured in sequence uh, as in not at one go. Uh, so all these things need to be considered in the analysis so that we take into account the correct set of stresses. Now there are two ways we can model uh, a composite structure. Number one is a grillage model where the main girders, the main eye girders as you can see here, uh, are represented by longitudinal line elements assigned with composite section properties. The composite section properties will include the effective slab width plus the eye girder for that particular section. Then the slab uh, transverse bending will be modeled as transverse elements in the grillage. The plate model on the other uh, instance uh, models everything as plates. So uh, either you can model the deck as plates and the main girders as beam elements. In such cases, uh, the, the effective width calculation is not necessary because the shear lag effect is uh, being considered automatically uh, by the plate elements. Uh, also, we may model the steel webs and uh, flanges as plate elements if we want to do a local analysis as in local buckling uh, analysis of steel sections. Uh, we can do uh, a complete plate model uh, which we have seen in the previous webinar on uh, how we can set up a uh, say a box girder section as a plated uh, web and flange section so in this particular webinar we will we'll confine ourselves to grillage model uh, because we want to focus more on the design checks that are being performed by the finite element software automatically Okay, so we'll consider two types of cases. One is a plate girder, uh, eye girder structure, and the other is a box girder, steel box girder structure. So I'm going to just uh, take you back to the software just to show you uh, some important, uh, just highlighting some important aspects uh, for a construction stage analysis of a composite uh, steel section. Right, so uh, here I have a model setup, uh, which is a grillage model just to show you the fleshed view okay so we have uh, the superstructure model completely okay you can see the transverse deck elements if i go to the top view that's the transverse elements is slightly curved horizontally and also inclined in a vertical plane okay the composite section uh, if i cut through a section in the middle Okay, so it's basically a composite steel box section or rather you can say a tub type of section if I just uh, show you the section properties just pulling out a window here so this is how the section properties look okay now in Midas uh, you can uh, define composite sections of various types so all those types are listed here like steel eye girder with a, comp uh, with a com composite slab 
and the eye gutter you can put in the slab thickness slab thickness and slab width okay or you can have a steel box type of section so a concrete slab and a complete box or a steel tub which has been used here so an open type of box section can be uh, used in the in, in, in the structure okay now we were talking about uh, construction stage analysis being very important for a composite type of section in order to take into account the um, the accumulation of stresses so we have modeled few construction stages stages so stage one includes uh, all the steel uh, girders steel uh, steel components being placed so stage two if you want to, you can be a more accurate uh, by putting in the exact steel uh, girders in uh, when they are being launched so i've neglected that stage here uh, just for keeping it uh, specific for this webinar um, but in reality we would go for each and every stage of construction where the steel girders are also being constructed in parts and being launched uh, step by step so that we get the exact uh, pre camber distributions etc so in stage 3 actually in stage 2 uh, we'll s we have uh, uh, all the uh, concrete loads on it on the stru uh, structure so wh wherever the deck has been poured so the deck has been poured from right from the end supports because we want to avoid as much uh, negative moments or hogging moments at the internal supports uh, so that the deck is not uh, cracked or to avoid tension in the deck over here so that's why we start pouring the deck from the ends so in stage 3 you'll see that end is poured and this end becomes composite stage 4 again th the right side uh, end becomes composite and you pour the next segment of the deck and so on Okay, we have uh, considered some creep and shrinkage properties as well as per euro codes you can you can define them so you can select the code here uh, whatever code you want uh, euro code or cbfip you can select and uh, define the compressive strength properties okay another important aspect that we need to make sure is that we have to consider uh, cracked properties correctly because once the structure becomes uh, fully composite uh, we will have 15% uh, of the the span on either side of internal support as cracked so we need to take care that of that uh, stiffness we don't overestimate the stiffness here for the concrete so what we do is we define cracked properties by chain by applying some stiffness scale factors so over here we have composite section for construction stage option where uh, we just select the second part so each composite section has two parts part one represent the steel part two represent concrete so in the part two concrete part we have uh, the stiffness of the concrete part displayed here all we want to do is just uh, uh, make sure all the uh, we just make all the scale factor is zero so here we can keep the scale factor zero wherever we have a cracked section property so i'm just looking into um, some other section over here so the cracked section would be this one so we change all the section uh, stiffness scale factors to zero and thus make sure that the composite uh, properties are assumed correctly okay and uh, just before running the analysis uh, we need to make sure that all the materials have been assigned correctly so if you are doing a composite design you need to make sure the comp uh, material properties are composite type so we've got three types of materials steel concrete and composite steel reinforced concrete or SRC so we just need to enter the steel properties and concrete properties that we are going to use in uh, use in analysis and, uh, and and in the design okay right so once we have made sure that all inputs are correct we can now move on to the design so the basis of design so uh, composite uh, steel gutter design uh, is um, 
is always uh, a two-step design process where we check everything all the ULS uh, checks are done at uh, at the steel only stage as well as on the composite stage when the uh, concrete is poured and acts compositely with the with the uh, with the steel section okay so here uh, there are two examples shown here if when in the case of plastic stress distributions uh, we have two cases if the concrete is uncracked uh, this is how the stress is going to be distributed uh, and the concrete is cracked we consider reinforcement uh, in our analysis so for the plastic stress distribution we have reinforcement acting plus the steel section so in our model also we can put uh, rebars in so here uh, i have put some uh, rebars in so if you see these rebars are put here so if uh, i i make all the section as cracked uh, i can consider the rebar properties uh, in the analysis or uh, as mentioned before you can al always change the scale factor so instead of zero you can use some other scale factor so that you represent the reinforcement correctly and similarly we have elastic stress distribution where uh, you have stress redistribution of uh, um, redistribution of stresses between concrete and steel once they become composite uh, the redistribution depends on the modular ratio of uh, between the um, between concrete and steel okay and again uh, based on the cracked and uncracked properties we will be either using reinforcement or we will be using slab concrete slab okay now let's move on to the next uh, topic which is the material properties that are being used for the design so uh, starting with concrete uh, as per Eurocode 2 uh, part 1 we define uh, the concrete stress strain relationship for composite design also so it can be either a parabolic rectangular or bilinear type of relationship uh, whatever we can follow or an equivalent rectangular stress block as we use most of the times as a simplified approach so uh, these the table shows different types of uh, concrete grades that uh, can be used uh, in a composite steel bridge and the relevant uh, uh, um, relevant properties like sh uh, like young's modulus etc Okay, then uh, there is also reinforcement uh, stress strain relationship. So we can def uh, again take it from Eurocode 2 uh, for reinforcement, uh, the, the idealized or the design curve, uh, which is a bilinear relationship, can be taken. Then for structural steel, we'll be following the same uh, guidelines as we uh, covered in the last webinar. Uh, for Eurocode 3, uh, we'll, we'll take up all the grades from there. For different uh, thicknesses of uh, plates, uh, we'll use different strength of steel. So these are given here, if thickness is less than 40, what kind of grade you should be using. And then the partial uh, material safety factors are listed. And these are to be taken from the National Annex. Okay. Now, when we have a uh, when we have a wide uh, wide slab, um, and we want to do a grillage analysis, um, in order to distribute the properties, the longitudinal properties correctly, uh, we calculate the effective slab width for the slab. Why? Because of to consider the shear lag effects. So, in order to do that, uh, there are uh, there, there are basically uh, various uh, guidelines given in Eurocode uh, 4 uh, part 2. So for example, if uh, your section under consideration lies in near the end support, okay, we'll be calculating the B effective okay, based on the length to be considered. So the length to be considered, if we see point number 1, Le, which is equal to 0.85 times L1. That's the length that we are going to consider for this particular any section lying in this particular zone. Okay, and we'll calculate B effective as given in the formula here. 
for end support okay so b0 being the uh, uh, distance between the shear connectors the shear connectors act as uh, the 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 connection between the slab and the steel girders so in later on we'll see how we design them uh, the, the design will be governed by the longitudinal shear carried by each uh, slab and the connected steel girder flange okay and similarly for mid span and internal supports we have uh, different uh, values of uh, effective length to be considered for the effective width calculation so typically uh, in the software itself we can perform such uh, uh, calculation directly so i'm going to open up a simple high gutter bridge to demonstrate that okay so again here we have a two span uh, composite plate high girder bridge so let me just uh, display the relevant parts of the structure only okay so that's the structure we're going to look at okay now uh, in order to calculate the effective width automatically uh, there's a feature in the software where we define the span information so we have composite bridge span information we enter the span select uh, one gutter at a time so let's say we've got okay so let's say we have selected one particular gutter here okay and we define which end uh, or which element is the support so we define the support location say first element and then somewhere in the middle and then last one so effect uh, it calculates the length here we register the information over here for all the girders and then the next step is the calculation of effective width based on this information so effective width Okay, and uh, distance shear connector distance say 0.2 meters. So we should show calculation results, and it will come up with uh, some effective width values over here. Okay, so if it is uh, the same uh, effective, uh, if it is same or a larger effective width, uh, the effective width will not change. It will be the same center to center spacing of the between the girders that we have uh, assumed or and if it is if it does changes uh, we will automatically get a value uh, reduced value for second moment of area that is moment of inertia and also the centroid will change uh, automatically so we'll get a table something like this which will have uh, though the variation is not much in this case uh, but we'll get some difference in the moment of inertia and also the center of gravity a centroid of the section okay so now moving on to the next uh, topic which is classification of cross sections okay so uh, any type of structural steel section uh, can be classified into four categories depending on the, its behavior so we have class one section uh, which can form a plastic hinge uh, with the rotation capacity with a sufficient rotation capacity um, required from the plastic analysis without any reduction in the resistance so it will follow a behavior like this um, if you see stress versus strain or a moment versus rotation uh, relationship class two is also similar but the its plastic uh, 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 ductility if you say is very very low so it will develop its plastic moment capacity plastic moment resistance but will have limited rotational capacity because it will buckle locally then class 3 is a type of section which will not reach its plastic uh, resistance moment of resistance in fact before reaching itself uh, it will buckle locally 
okay so it will have a yield it will cross its yield strength but it will not reach its plastic capacity class 4 on the other hand is the most critical one uh, where which will not reach its yield stress and will buckle locally before yielding okay now each part of the uh, structural uh, steel section will be classified separately so there are different guidelines given in euro code 3 uh, tables which will help us determine what is the class of flange and what is the class of the web these uh, classifications depend upon the slenderness of the parts so slenderness of the flange slenderness of the web they also depend upon the stress so in case of uh, in case of components uh, not reaching the elastic limit or within the elastic limit like class 4 section it will depend upon uh, the stress the actual stresses in the section so uh, for example in if according to this table if you see a uh, class of flange if it is if you have a class say 2 flange and uh, the web class of the web is class 4 so since the most critical component is a class 4 section uh, therefore the total class of the section will also be class 4 okay so that's how we determine the classes of different section okay so here are some tables given as per euro code uh, some uh, methods to determine the class of the section class 1 2 and 3 can be determined from euro code 3 uh, 1 1 and class 4 can be determined uh, um, from euro code 3 1 5 now for class 4 sections uh, effective width has to be calculated for on uh, the plates now, there are two cases the plates can be unstiffened as in there are no longitudinal stiffeners in the plates or the plates can be stiffened uh, that is they there are longitudinal stiffeners in the plates in the webs or flanges in both cases the methods are uh, different uh, there so we'll first cover the unstiffened plates um, for effective width of class 4 type of sections um, there are two types two phenomena being considered for calculation of effective width first is a shear lag now shear lag is uh, for cases where you have wide flanges like box cutters so in this per case and most of the cases uh, the shear lag effect is does not um, uh, amount to a large value or does, is, is not very large uh, to be included in the calculation of effective width of a steel section but plate buckling is important and usually is uh, reduce uh, is, is a governing factor for reducing the effective width of uh, of flanges of or webs so as you can see here for internal compression elements uh, based on the stress distribution um, a reduction factor uh, is being used okay, to calculate the effective width now uh, the way we calc the way we find out uh, uh, the f uh, the effective width is displayed over here we calculate the slenderness of the of the element under consideration so if it's an internal element like in the case of a plate gutter it, uh, it will be the web which is an internal element we calculate the slenderness ratio shown here okay uh, psi is used psi is the uh, stress ratio so the stress between the extreme fibers of that element is being considered okay all right similarly effective width of uh, stiffened plates um, is also is very similar but the difference is that uh, here uh, we consider for each sub panel so for example if this is a flange which is different with longitudinal plate elements uh, we consider the effective width calculation for each sub panel that is the plate lying between each longitudinal stiffener so like this we calculate the effective width uh, the, the some portion is removed from the section okay and we calculate a reduction factor uh, now here the uh, there are two types of buckling that we consider one is the column type buckling which is more uh, critical in this case because of the longitudinal stiffening 
the entire plate will behave as a single element so chances of local buckling will reduce local plate buckling will reduce but column type buckling uh, is more uh, evident here so first step is to determine the effective uh, uh, determine the effective uh, width um, as or, or the reduction factor actually as per the uh, plate type buckling so for plate type buckling we use this formula sigma cr is calculated from annex a of uh, eurocode 315 uh, which is uh, um, which is different for different number of stiffeners so for uh, say uh, number of stiffeners equals 1 we have a certain method of calculating sigma crp and for 2 3 etc uh, number of stiffeners now once we calculate uh, this uh, value of rho we then calculate the final value of rho c uh, which is the final um, reduction factor that we will be using in for calculating effective width. This row will include the column buckling as well. So, here if you see the uh, this component chi c which is reduction factor due to column buckling is calculated uh, using this equation and it, which utilizes a slenderness uh, factor uh, using sigma, sigma critical which is calculated from here for a stiffened plate. Okay, so pretty much a straightforward equation. Uh, we put in the, um, the the relevant values over here, and then calculate the effective uh, reduction factor, including column plus plate buckling. Okay, now all this is done by Midas uh, automatically. Okay. So we'll look at how Midas does it. Uh, before that, we'll just cover a few other checks. So ULS checks. Okay. So starting with the moment resistance check, and uh, uh, there are two types of uh, um, um, sections uh, section checks that are done for moment resistance. Um, first is the plastic moment of resistance. So any type of class one or two sections will be checked for plastic moment of resistance. So for positive moment, uh, we consider the entire slab before in the plastic section analysis. Uh, we tend to ignore rebars as they are very negligible as compared to the entire slab area. And for negative moment, uh, it is hogging cases which are typical at the internal supports. We consider the uh, concrete area to be neglected and only the tensile rebar is considered for plastic uh, moment resistance. So um, we calculate plastic neutral axis and then uh, calculate the lever arm of the plastic uh, forces on each um, part steel and concrete and that's how we get a plastic moment resistance now in case if we have uh, the plastic moment resistance greater than 40 percent of the height overall height of the section as shown in the table we will be uh, then reducing um, or we will be uh, checking the interaction of the actual force as well. So uh, as per the equation shown here, we will modify the moment of resistance. Uh, also there is a beta factor as shown in the graph on the right side here. Uh, once uh, the plastic uh, neutral axis uh, increases from uh, increases in depth from 15% to 40% of the total height will be using a factor beta as a multiplier uh, to plastic moment of resistance. Uh, uh, while we are at plastic moment of resistance, it is also worth uh, to note that uh, some uh, type of sections that we are coming up these days are filler beam decks and in filler beam decks the concept is similar. Uh, we use a composite action. Uh, the only thing is we make the deck more stiff. Uh, so that we get a much reduced uh, requirement for the depth uh, which is very useful for uh, to for very low uh, overhead clearances uh, over railway tracks we can use this uh, type of uh, bridges uh, most of um, in most of the cases because you have such a large section of concrete uh, the 
the steel eye sections are mostly class 1 or 2 in these cases and hence are checked against plastic moment of resistance. Uh, elastic moment of resistance on the other hand depend upon the elastic stress limits. Okay, so uh, they are calculated as uh, the sum of uh, your moment of resistance, mo the applied moments before the section becomes composite plus k times the uh, moment addition moment after the uh, st structure becomes composite or including the action of concrete as well. So, the value of k is determined by uh, these uh, by the fact that uh, it's it, it is uh, a stress limit um, on a particular part of the section that has been applied. So, for example, if I have to calculate the uh, k uh, value of k uh, in steel girder, then I'll be limiting any one end, extreme end of the steel girders with uh, F y, which is the yield strength of steel, and we'll be equating it with the actual stresses uh, on that steel section, which is basically moment uh, divided by the section modulus. So, as shown in this table, this is how k is calculated. This is uh, the lowest value that I get from all these three equations will be the value of k that I am going to put in here. Okay. M A and M C uh, the summation of these two values is the total moment that I get for the entire composite section. So, from this equation I get uh, elastic moment of resistance. Sorry. Okay. So, that is how uh, we can derive the moment of resistance and compare it with the applied moments. Now, moving on to uh, vertical shear. Uh, so, uh, in the vertical shear, uh, we have uh, the similar uh, rules that we apply for structural steel design. We have plastic shear resistance and the shear buckling check. So, if uh, uh, the criteria for shear buckling is shown here, if this is met, then we have to do um, shear buckling check, which is a summation of the com contribution of shear resistance from the web plus the shear resistance uh, from the flange. Okay. Now, uh, this uh, uh, the shear buckling check requires us to input or to consider the spacing of the transverse stiffener and the uh, location of longitudinal stiffeners correctly because this is a buckling which happens uh, locally. So, th suppose this is the arrangement uh, we have sub panels here. So, for each sub panel we will be checking the shear buckling. The conditions are sh shown here. We will calculate a, 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 a factor uh, a coefficient for buckling k tau is calculated. It is depending on the long number of longitudinal stiffeners. Again this is as per the code Euro code 315. Okay, so, we calculate uh, from k tau we get um, a function called lambda w okay, and from lambda w we get the reduction factor chi. So, this uh, the factor chi is then put in this equation to calculate vbw which is web buckling resistance. And also for cases where the transverse stiffeners are very closely spaced, um, the flange starts spanning between the transverse stiffeners. So, any kind of vertical resistance will be also uh, can potentially be borne by the uh, by the flanges um, through their uh, stiffness. So, uh, the part of the flange that resists such kind of shear uh, forces uh, is is shown here as uh, as a factor c. So, this distance c is calculated here as per this formula and thus uh, the flange shear resistance is calculated. If we have uh, an a coexisting axial force, we can include the effect of that axial force as in it will lead to a decrease in the uh, the moment of uh, the flange moment of resistance mfrd because MFRD is basically calculated using the plastic capacity of the flange. Okay, and in case of bending and shear uh, both acting together, 
if this particular condition eta 3 is uh, uh, is verified that is the total shear force applied divided by the shear resistance is greater than 50 percent then we need to consider the interaction of bending and shear both uh, there are two cases first is if it is an elastic case where we have class 1 or 2 we have a reduction factor calculated as per this formula this is directly applied to um, applied to the uh, um, the, the strength of the steel to calculate the plastic uh, moment capacity of class 1 or 2 sections. Okay. In case of elastic uh, moment uh, capacities, if shear buckling is uh, is the governing case, then uh, we satisf we calculate eta 1 plus this factor uh, times this value should be less than or equal to 1. Uh, eta 1 is basically applied moment divided by the plastic moment of resistance of the class uh, 1 or the class 3 or 4 section. Uh, if shear buckling is not governing then we modify this equation and put in this check. Okay. In case of box cutter flange, uh, this, there are few limitations in the Midas uh, software that uh, does not take into uh, consideration the torsional shear stress. So here uh, we can uh, we have to manually put some factors in the load combinations within the software to take care of the torsional shear stress in the calculation. So uh, in the flange we just uh, calculate the in plane shear stress and we perform the uh, this check as shown here. Eta one is the direct stress check uh, component. Eta 3 is the shear stress check component. Okay. However, the, uh, there is an additional check that we need to do which is the shear maximum shear stress should be uh, should be equal to this um, should should be actually uh, less than uh, this value tau r d which is uh, uh, simply a reduction factor multiplied by the shear strength. Okay, and similarly, if you have bending and axial force acting together, then uh, we need to consider uh, this this check additionally. Okay, so pretty much a straightforward uh, summation of uh, different ratios, axial capacity ratio and moment capacity ratio it should be less than one for class one and two sections. For class three section, it should be less than uh, the strength yield strength of the steel. Okay, now here are some additional checks for lateral torsion buckling resistance for composite sections. Now, usually the th the check that is followed in uh, Midas uh, the code based checks is the simplified method defined in Eurocode four part two, where it assumes a plate girder section to be a un inverted U uh, U U frame section. Okay. So, for the inverted U frame, uh, as per Eurocode uh, three. Uh, um, as per Eurocode 315, uh, we have some uh, values given for the equivalent stiffness of the U frame structure. So, if uh, we have a U frame like this, um, or if you see over here, you will have uh, the connection between the slab and the steel girders defined as a spring stiffness. So, that spring stiffness is entered and uh, then the spacing of the u frames is defined as l so we get a cd upon l which is spring stiffness upon the uh, spacing of the u frames and based on that uh, based on these inputs we calculate the value of uh, lambda for lot lateral torsion buckling okay so this m is a uh, minimum of m1 and m2 which is again dependent on uh, these values uh, spring stiffness and also uh, the ratio of the shear forces at both ends of a composite structure. So, both the rigid ends of composite structure, so one cross pressing to the other cross pressing, uh, we need to see the ratio between the shear forces, uh, which is mu, which is put in this equation, and from here we get uh, uh, the value of lambda. And once we get lambda, we can calculate the, uh, the reduction factor chi as per the usual equation 
uh, for any any type of buckling check okay so once we get this reduction factor we just uh, multiply it with the uh, moment of resistance so in in case uh, we have a class 3 or 4 section the moment of resistance will be elastic moment of resistance in case class 1 or 2 then it will be a plastic moment of resistance so uh, when when we do that we get a mbrd which is a lateral buckling resistance this value should be greater than uh, the applied moment and it will it once it is greater than that it's okay for lateral torsion buckling here is there is a term nbrd uh, there is a um, another addition check that we need to do which is a combination of axial buckling plus bending uh, lateral torsion buckling resistance check so axial buckling calculation is very simple uh, for cracked composite section we just calculate the uh, reduction factor based on the uh, direct column buckling uh, uh, curve given in euro code 3 okay but generally for lateral torsion buckling check uh, because the u frame approach is valid for uh, simply supported sections only uh, it's an approximation so most of the times it gives a conservative result so to be more accurate we follow a more finite element based concept where we first calculate the uh, critical load factor causing the buckling due to a uh, plate model uh, can we model everything in finite element plates and we get alpha alpha cr which is a uh, buckling load factor alpha ultimate we calculate from this equation Okay, and once we get these two values, we get lambda, which is again a slenderness ratio. And from this slenderness ratio, we can put it in any of the equations for lateral buckling or lateral torsion buckling. We calculate chi, and that should satisfy this uh, inequality. Um, as long as it satisfies, we are okay with lateral torsion buckling. So this is a more um, accurate description of lateral torsion buckling which uh, we have covered in the previous webinars uh, using plate models okay now uh, before going to the other checks uh, let me just go back to the model and uh, show you some basic calculations okay so we're back in the eye girder uh, bridge steel eye girder bridge now we'll look at uh, how we can design uh, the structure so we have set up the model now we are going to design it uh, so results uh, combination is where we first define the combination so you will see in under steel design tab we define the combination as either strength or serviceability so I've defined one combination ULS uh, with different load factors dead load by concrete uh, surfacing now important thing is that we should take all these forces uh, from the uh, construction stage itself Okay, so here it should be from the wet concrete uh, taken from the construction stage as shown here okay uh, and uh, similarly we have defined fact uh, a combination of fatigue which should include only the fatigue load model we'll be coming to fatigue in the next subsequent slides and similarly we have defined two combinations for SLS one is for characteristic the other is for uh, frequent combination right so uh, for designing this uh, structure we go to design tab composites design the first thing is setting up design parameters so here is where you define all the material property uh, the partial factors so you have to look into the national annex for all these factors we check whatever ch um, design checks we want to do we just tick them on okay now let's select one of the steel girders so I've just selected one over here is one internal set of girders okay and then design material so this is where we define what type of material we're going to use for concrete steel and reinforcement so I've just defined them previously uh, steel grade 355 concrete is C40 and uh, the strength of the bars to be used after that we define longitudinal reinforcement if any so a longitudinal reinforcement will be used in composite checks uh, only in the cracked section cracked zone 
because in other zones because of the stiffness of the concrete being too large reinforcement will be neglected so in the pier diaphragm zone or in the um, composite uh, tapered zone we will define some reinforcement okay defining reinforcement is very simple in the software here so we define a guideline say 50 millimeters from the uh, fr from the face of the concrete and then we just join all the points like create just simply snap the points define the number of bars we want in that line say 10 bars or something and that's how um, the reinforcement is calculated or added up the next thing is uh, defining longitudinal stiffness so if we have a very deep uh, web we can define long uh, longitudinal stiffness as well so like here we, I have just for our sake of example I have uh, defined longitudinal stiffness so we have selected one particular section width of the stiffener and thickness of the stiffener have been put in number of stiffeners on the web so two stiffeners the distance of the stiffener from the top of the slab and the spacing between the two stiffeners have been entered okay and after that we define the design position as in where which elements we want to design so we just select all of them or some of them and apply then uh, for few elements you can extract the uh, excel uh, full excel calculation which i find very handy uh, especially for uh, putting in the final reports to show each and every step for critical elements then shear connector information Okay, so I'll come to shear connector a little bit later, but first let's look at transverse stiffener. So we select all the elements uh, and define the spacing of the stiffener. So this is very important for shear buckling check that we enter the uh, stiffeners, uh, the spacing of the stiffener and the uh, width and thickness of the stiffener properly. This will also help us to do the stiffener design. Uh, so we enter uh, say thick width of the stiffeners as hundred. Uh, say 150 millimeters thickness of the stiffener as let's say uh, 12 millimeters or 16 millimeters and pitch is the spacing of the stiffener so let's say 1.5 meters or 2 meters and apply there are two other types of stiffeners uh, this is based on the uh, sub panel checks so you can have an intermediate rigid transverse stiffener within a sub panel or you can have a flexible a non-rigid type of transverse stiffener lying between uh, uh, a two uh, rigid transverse stiffener. Transverse stiffeners can be both side of the web so there is an option for two sided and one sided which we can use. Okay, So once we have selected it we can apply so different set of elements can have different spacing of stiffeners or different uh, uh, geometry of stiffeners you can selectively do that by just selecting elements and clicking apply okay now there was a terminology that we used uh, earlier uh, that is rigid uh, end post so rigid end post and non rigid end post even those can be defined because that will uh, define uh, how we are going to calculate the reduction factor from lambda Okay, so there is an option where we can put in uh, the value of rigid and non-rigid end post. Okay, so all we have to do is select the support node. So, for example, number three is a support node over here. Whether it's rigid end post or non-rigid, we just select, define the width, thickness, and is the eccentricity from the support itself so it may not be the the transverse stiffener or the rigid end post may not be lying exactly on the bearing location it will be uh, maybe having some eccentricity we can enter that eccentricity here to consider the effect in the design okay so lateral torsion buckling as I mentioned uh, we don't really uh, 
uh, always follow the code based uh, lateral torsion buckling check because of as i mentioned of its uh, assumption that it's a uh, u inverted u frame uh, whereas inverted u frame um, formulation is given as uh, by assuming a simply supported case in the code so distance between the springs uh, which is distance between the u frames provided here select all the elements put in this value let's say 1 meter and spring stiffness which is the stiffness between uh, the cross girders and the the vertical members of a u frame okay now moving on to transverse force on a wave so uh, so when we have a concentrated force acting on the flange then uh, th th then the web of the section can buckle web of the i section can buckle and move transversely so the transverse force on the webs um, uh, needs to be checked so in case of composite sections the the wheel load effect is not that governing um, so we consider the bearing effect in this case uh, so wherever we have a bearing location we check for transverse force on the webs now uh, there are uh, three types of uh, distribution of the force okay, either it can be on one side of the uh, flange load applied on one side of the flange carried by the webs or load applied on the other uh, one side of the flange carried by the webs but resisted by the other side of the flange as well or it can be a free end as shown here type c so we need to define what type of the section it is so in the in the type of load application we select our zone for example this particular zone which is uh, at the internal support define a which is the uh, distance between the two stiffeners so let's say 2 meters or 1 meter and ss is the bearing area again bearing area will be different for different load conditions as shown here okay, okay and uh, then we def we calculate uh, eta 2 and eta 1 eta 1 is straightforward from the pre equation of uh, combined axial and moment ratios capacity ratios um, and uh, eta 2 is FED upon FRD FRD is the transverse force resistance uh, FRD is uh, calculated um, by using an effective length formulation. L effective is again calculated uh, using uh, LY, which is uh, which is basically different uh, for different types of force application. Okay. Okay. Now moving on to longitudinal shear checks. Uh, longitudinal shear checks are uh, used to design the shear connectors the number of shear connectors diam diameter spacing etc now longitudinal shear check uh, we calculate the shear stress applied per uh, meter of the shear connector and compare it with the shear resistance shear capacity of the shear stud per meter of the again shear connectors so shear resistance of headed stud is determined from this equation okay and in case of elastic shear stress elastic cases the shear stress that has been applied is directly calculated using the shear flow equation so we cut through a section like if you want to calculate at the junction uh, normally shear connectors will be at the junction of steel girder and the con concrete flange concrete uh, slab so we cut through the concrete slab uh, calculate shear flow at that junction that will determine the shear uh, stress per unit uh, per meter of shear connector and for inelastic cases or pl plastic cases we actually calculate the shear stress corresponding to the plastic capacity of the structure so we calculate as if uh, there was plastic uh, actual force actual force flowing through the slab and the uh, and and the flange the dip, uh, steel flange so the difference between the steel flange ax steel axial force and the slab axial force will determine the uh, longitudinal uh, longitudinal shear being carried by the shear connector 
so that shear stress uh, that that will give us the shear stress to be used for this check so once this check is satisfied we can say okay the longitudinal shear connectors are having the right proportion okay so regardless of this uh, if we have a full plate full blown plate model we can always do a finite element von mises check instead of doing a separate pending moment axial force check uh, so uh, but there there are a few limitations to this uh, check uh, we can we cannot consider the shear uh, buckling in this type of cases okay. uh, for box cutters uh, in order to consider torsion and shear in this equation we slightly modify the von mises stress check equation like this uh, which again is uh, very similar to what we covered in the euro code 3 Okay, now moving on to fatigue strength. So fatigue strength depends on number of factors like number of cycles of str uh, stress cycles, um, then design life of the structure, number of joints in the structure, etc. So there are so many f uh, factors lambda one to lambda four, which are given in the code uh, for different types of bridges. So those are calculated and put in this uh, equation. Uh, and based on that the software or compares whether the stress range uh, defined for fatigue loads uh, is in correlation with the direct stress range that uh, we, we get from an elastic analysis. Okay. So fatigue load models 3 is used for highway bridges and load model 71 for railway bridges. In a load combination only fatigue load models should be used for a fatigue strength check. Okay, and then we move on to the transverse tech reinforcement design. So once we have calculated, we have done the structural steel check, calculated longitudinal reinforcement based on the shrinkage and crack control in concrete. Uh, we have to do some additional checks for determining the transverse uh, reinforcement. So the transverse reinforcement number one depends upon, uh, first of all, there's a minimum uh, reinforcement criteria in Eurocode 2. Second, uh, also on the shrinkage properties of concrete in the transverse direction. And uh, in case of composite section, it specially depends upon the splitting effect and longitudinal shear effect. So in nearby the shear connectors, uh, there is high uh, concentration of stresses due to the longitudinal shear. These uh, can result in different modes of failure. So they are shown over on the screen. So depending upon the arrangement of shear connectors, uh, the mode of failure will be different and that mode of failure will determine the area of steel that is required in the transverse direction to resist that shear. Okay, so for example, if I take the case uh, where you have the surface AA, okay, it is, uh, the if, if there is any splitting in this area due to longitudinal shear, it has to be resisted by both top and bottom reinforcement. So area of AB plus AT is used for calculating the required steel and in case of uh, the if the fail if, if you have to calculate the bottom required bottom uh, transverse reinforcement then we need to see the failure at surface BB and that will define the uh, area of steel required in the bottom zone okay. And then finally moving on to serviceability checks. Okay, serviceability checks uh, for deflection, there are no uh, specified rules directly in Eurocode for composite uh, structures. But uh, we can use some basic rules for steel frames uh, like for beams L by 250 and columns L by 300. Uh, stress checks however are very important for structural steel. Uh, we do a von Mises stress check uh, which is direct uh, a square root of sum of squares of uh, direct stress plus uh, the th shear stress okay that should be less than the yield strength uh, then concrete slab compression limit check uh, which is uh, limit on the compression of concrete then uh, reinforcement stress limit check and finally longitudinal shear check is done the method of doing longitudinal shear check in sls is very similar to what we did in uls except that there is an additional factor used KS which is used to calculate the uh, shear uh, capacity of uh, shear stud uh, in SLS. Okay, now let's look at uh, how 
the software calculates these for these all ULS uh, check values. So whatever we have covered till now, uh, let's see how to define the fatigue strength checks. So in the damage equivalence factor, uh, we define the lambda 2 and lambda 4 lam uh, values. Lambda 1 to lambda 3 values are calculated automatically by the software. Uh, we need to put in uh, we, we need to put in some other fatigue strength uh, partial factors over here okay okay and then uh, we we can output the results in the form of table format like pending resistance so we get a table like this which will show us uh, the classification of the sections top bottom etc web top flange bottom flange web section class and also the effective section due to class 4 sections so wherever the section is class 4 we can get uh, the, eff uh, the effective area and uh, section properties for axial alone and for bending alone plus this row C which is basically the uh, combined reduction factor due to column and plate buckling Okay, and here we get plastic moment resistance, elastic, and the final moment resistance. Similarly, there are tables we can generate for vertical shear to have a look at the summary of the checks. So VBRD is the shear buckling resistance, and VPLRD is the plastic moment plastic shear resistance. And uh, apart from these tables, uh, if you want to look at more detail, then we can print out the results. So I've got some results extracted out from the software. So this is element number one two one six, which is somewhere in the uh, in the in near the internal support. Okay, so we'll have a look at how the report is being generated. So for positive moment checks, uh, it calculates the forces in that zone. If you see, you have before after before composite after composite uh, section properties and the correct section pro properties if required in case of uh, negative moments. So classification of the section is done for positive moment which basically in this case is uh, not relevant because it's a uh, internal support section so hogging will be governing so negative moments here so stresses are calculated at different areas left right top bottom in flange and in web okay so we have got plastic resistance moment class one section okay then resistance to vertical shear okay so that's the uh, calculation done okay plastic moment of resistance is being calculated then uh, contribution from since uh, shear buckling resistance is required in this case so contribution from the web is calculated contribution from the flange reduction factor for axial force so uh, if there is an actual force acting simultaneously the plastic moment of resistance for the flange is reduced so shear resistance is checked including the both web and flange contribution then lateral torsion buckling as per the simplified approach given in the code is used over here resistance to transverse force so verification for compression by actually eta 1 uh, type of uh, type of the uh, force application was type A which is for single bearing then resistance to longitudinal shear for shear connectors being used shear resistance of single stiffeners single connectors etc okay, and finally stress limitation checks okay. Similarly, for mid span elements, so element 94 is a mid span element. We have uh, pending resistance for this type of uh, structure. Okay. Also, uh, just to show you how the same similar type of table looks like for a box section. So, composite box section also has got uh, a similar type of section generated. Difference is uh, it checks for um, 
classification of more number of parts okay so for example uh, in case of uh, shear specially uh, because in box section we use tend to use a lot of uh, longitudinal stiffeners okay so here if you see on the web specially left web and right web the shear check has been done considering the ISL which is the longitudinal stiffener stiffness so in in the model we can define some uh, stiffener values so I'll just open up the box cutter model again okay so this is the box cutter model and uh, here I have defined in the box cutter for each section some stiffener values so define three number of stiffness on the webs and one number of stiffness on the flange so those uh, stiffener uh, properties will be used uh, during the uh, calculation of the shear buckling resistance okay again lateral torsion buckling here does not have a meaning because we don't really use the simplified approach in this case okay, transverse forces have been calculated by the same formulation okay so coming back to the presentation Okay, so that brings us uh, to the end of the presentation uh, today. Um, in summary, we, sp uh, we talked about how uh, Midas Civil can be used for an optimized uh, composite steel design for both plate girders and box girders. We saw how we can um, use all the ULS and SLS checks uh, that we, we can that are there in Eurocode uh, and what we should be careful about um, while doing the uh, composite steel design especially in terms of lateral torsion buckling and uh, uh, fatigue checks uh, etc uh, we there are other aspects of the composite design which we couldn't cover in this webinar because of the lack of time and also because of the, f the these topics are more relevant for upcoming webinars like crack control in slabs in composite composite design and also flange induced uh, web buckling so for other topics for free uh, other bespoke presentation please contact the Midas UK support team okay thank you for watching bye for now